So now what we will do is till this Barrett sees of August, whatever we read, I'll just quickly go through for next uh, 10 minutes so that we will start with the Barrett sees of August uh, again. Okay, shall we have a quick glance of whatever we discussed? Yes, so close your notebooks, close your pen and close everything. I'm also keeping a blank uh, sheet. So just we are going to revise in next five minutes, entire thing. So first we have discussed about the GIT. We have started with the uh, esophagus. In esophagus, we have seen the anatomical uh, structures of your esophagus. Then we have seen an important lower esophageal sphincter, upper esophageal sphincter. Next, we slowly move towards the, what are the investigation of choice which we have. We have seen all the modalities. In that, manometry is very important. What is the classification used in manometry? Chicago classification. Chicago 4.0 classification is used in the manometry. So, this is as far as importance in your first part. Okay. And you have seen the blood vessel supplying your esophagus. Blood vessel supplying your esophagus, we divide with the uh, upper one third, middle one third, lower one third. Upper one third is supplied by the inferior thyroid artery, inferior thyroid artery. Middle one third is supplied by the uh, descending thoracic iota and your bronchial artery, and it is going to be uh, drained by a vagus vein. And in your lower esophagus, it is going to be supplied by a left gastric vein and your gastric artery and drained by left gastric vein. This is what we saw in the first part. Is it clear? Now, close your eyes again. Now, we are going to discuss about the uh, second part of the topic that is going to be foreign body. So, when you are going to talk about the foreign body, it is going to be beyond C6. Uh, and what you are going to do? What are the commonest food that your uh, battery? Coin, uh, coin battery, like your round battery. So when you are going to have your round battery, button battery, you are going to do an endoscopic removal. Then we move on towards the corrosive injuries. Corrosive injuries for the acid alkali render. Acid causes what? Alkali causes what? That you need to remember. Acid causes liquefactive necrosis or coagulative necrosis. What does it cause? Can someone tell me? Can someone put in the chat box? So what it is going to cause? Your... Uh, Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I'm getting an answer. Very good. So remember, acid is going to cause coagulative necrosis and your alkali is going to cause liquefactive necrosis. How to remember this? Alkali, L is there. So it is a liquefactive necrosis. Uh, acid, C is there. So it is going to be coagulative necrosis. Like that you can remember. What are going to be the coagulative, uh, what are going to be the coagulative necrosis? Stomach is going to be most common in acid. And in alkali only, esophagus is going to be most commonly injured. And uh, you're going to remember that. Next is going to be, you're going to talk about the Zagar classification, Zagar classification of uh, endoscopic description. So we have started with your grade 0 to grade 4, grade 0 normal mucosa, grade 1 when there is going to be edema or edema, grade 2 when it is going to involve a submucosa alone. So mucosa, submucosa, first one there is going to be hemorrhagic lesion, second one circumferential lesion, A, B. And uh, you're going to have your grade 3, grade 3, there is going to be a grade 3, there is going to be a muscle involvement. So in the muscle involvement, again, A, B, you're going to divide. Grade A, only focal, necro focal necrosis or focal lesions. Grade 3, B, like extensive lesions. Grade 4 is going to be your perforation. Okay, grade 4 is going to be perforation. Then how it will be presented? It presents like a sub, uh, there is going to be a substernal pain, dysphagia, vomiting and hypersalivation. 24 hours endoscopy to check the mucosal drainage has occurred. Upper you have your phase 1, phase 2, phase 3 and you are going to have your intestinal necrosis, infection, inflammation, necrosis, uh, fibrosis will be occurring at the end. Next, we are going to move towards the management of corrosive in injury. Corrosive in injury, level, the IV fluid, could no blind tube insert, panna, panna kuda prophylactic antibiotic is not required, no role of steroid, early uh, skilled in endoscopy is needed, definitive management is going to be a stricture, dilatation, esophagectomy, reconstruction after six months. Okay, after the dysphagia, lusoria, patho, it's going to be a complete uh, esophagus is going to be, what happens is there is going to be a esophagus is going to be there. Your vascular structures are going to be there because of that, that is going to get compressed. So esophagus is going to get compressed by vascular structures, aberrant vascular structures. Mm -hmm. That will be causing dysphagia. Next, we move on towards tracheoesophageal fistula. There are actually six types. Uh, so type, uh, type A is the isolated esophageal fistula, atresia without fistula, type B is the proximal fistula, type C is the distal fistula, type B is the proximal and distal fistula and type H is going to be like isolated fistula. So, vandhi, uh, there will be a 
Esophagus will be patent, but there will be a fistula with tracheal esophagus. So, what is going to be the clinical feature? Respiratory distress and excessive salivations will be there. Then we moved on towards the diagnosis. Diagnosis, you will be uh, giving a contrast. Contrast, in a contrast could be an iron exol contrast. This is asked in 2019 NEET exam. And investigation of choice is going to be H type because the, you go for esophagoscopy. So, what are the other abnormality you find in the H type? You will be having VATRAL. V stands for your vertebral defect. A stands for your uh, anorectal malformation and ER stands for your esophageal fistula. You're going to have esophageal fistula, tracheoesophageal fistula and REA stands for renal agents and L stands for limb defect. Then moving on towards the treatment, uh, treatment take a first class pipe and draw. So water scent classification less than 2.5 kg are the less or more than 2.5 kg are the without pneumonia. You go for surgical treatment 1.5 kg to 2.5 kg without pneumonia. You go for a weight gain, nutrition followed by surgery with uh, when there's a pneumonia antibiotic and surgery when there is going to be less than 1.5 kg plus or minus uh, pneumonia you go for feeding gastrectomy antibiotic followed by delayed surgery next what is going to be the surgery cameron night surgery cameron night surgery is performed for bcde so remove the fistula connected repair the trachea and anastomose the end atresia varindadina anastomose pandrenga oru vela vandu far aarudhu rendu end na you go for gastrostomy and uh, followed by your antibiotic okay as they come close to each other you are going to go for surgery next you move on towards your GERD GERD is not important cost no? number one is going to be your length so length of the intra-abdominal compartment of the esophagus 3 to 5 cm no? number two right crude crux of your diaphragm larka, right crude or third one on the angle of this fourth one on the na, uh, loss of function of your gastroesophageal sphincter tone or length or loss of function here, but number five is going to be your gastric reservoir and your arrangement of gastric mucosal fold. Then we moved on towards the earliest indicator is going to be transient lower esophageal relaxation TLOSR. What is TLOSR? So you have a peristalsis. So normal peristalsis wave followed by there will be a esophageal rela sphincter relaxation. But transient there can be a lower esophageal sphincter relaxation because of uh, what? Because of the uh, to release the uh, swallowed air. So latest Bailey and Asulrana increase in obesity and decrease in H. pylori contributes towards the GERB. And what is going to be the clinical feature? Retrosternal heart pain, bad taste in oral cavity, you have pharyngitis and you have your uh, dental caries and uh, investigation of choice is going to be endoscopy, salary, millers, uh, salary, miller uh, classification is there, but that is not necessary. Management is your lifestyle changes, frequent small meal and when you go for indication, surgery. So we go for surgery when there is a failure of medical therapy, when there is going to be a complications. What are the complications? Esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus and picture and it is associated with hiatal hernia and patient when they, you will be going for the surgery. Patient willing to go for surgery. So, when the, what are the principles of surgery? One, we have to restore the adequate length of the esophagus. Number two, tighten the diaphragmatic crura. Number three, to wrap the fundus around the esophagus. Number four, to preserve the vagus. And number five, to re-establish the angle of is. So, fundoplication, you have two things. One, complete wrap, in one partial wrap. Complete wrap, in the sense, 360 degree, you are going to wrap. Uh, partial wrap, you have door, Tuppet and Belsi mark. Door when the Padagana 180 degree, Tuppet when the 120 to 2, 180 to 270 degree, Belsi when the Padagana 270 degree mala. All these are going to be helping in restoring the adequate length of esophagus to restore the adequate length of esophagus. Newer modalities are there. So polymer injection in the esophageal sphincter, but uh, that tightens the sphincter, but long-term complications are plus on the recurrence rate. Adigo. And endoscopic RFA can be done. Radio frequency ablation can be done and magnetic sphincter uh, Augmentation can be done. Tempo, transoral incision less fundoplication. So, 270 degree fundoplication work, you can do that. This is one of the component of your natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery that is called as nodes. Within five minutes, we revise whatever we discussed in last one and a half hours. So, clear. Next, what we are going to go is, we are going to discuss about the... Next, what we are going to do, we are going to discuss about a very important topic that is going to be your Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer. Barrett's esophagus pathy, if you wanted me to talk. So, it is a squamous metaplasia of columnar dysplasia. So, it is going to be a squamous metaplasia, columnar dysplasia. Write it down along with me. Squamous metaplasia, metaplasia. And you have this 
columnar dysplasia columnar dysplasia so what happens is uh, because of this this it forms a barrett's esophagus so what are the causes of cause uh, metaplasia of your squamous squamous metaplasia occurs in number one intestinal so intestinal cause is going to be the most common or it can occur at the junction it can occur at junctional or it can occur at the cardiac fundus okay or your gastric fundus Similarly, okay, so your columnar dysplasia, in the squamous dysplasia, they can be either of two types. Either it can be high grade or it can be actually low grade. Okay, either it can be high grade or it can be low grade. So when do you call it as a Barrett's esophagus? When do you call it as a Barrett's esophagus? So squamous, man, it is going to change into columnar. So squamous is slowly metaplasia, dysplasia. Okay, so squamous changes to columnar, metaplasia to dysplasia. So what happens is there is going to be a specialized intestinal metaplasia. So okay, there is going to be red velvety mucosa. You can see red velvety mucosa red velvety mucosa can be seen so this a peculiar feature in and pathona when you call it as a barrett's esophagus when you see goblet cells when you see goblet cells even a single goblet cell even a single goblet cell if you're going to see even if you see single goblet cells you actually call it as a barrett's esophagus you actually call it as barrett's esophagus okay you call it as barrett's esophagus very very important so classica when it is going to be more than three centimeter columnar so when it is going to be more than equal to three centimeter columnar cell columnar cell you going to call this as a barrett's you call this as a barrett's esophagus you call this as a barrett's esophagus very important okay well, cardia metaplasia more common when the length increases more risk of malignancy will be there whenever the length is increases more risk of malignancy is there so depending upon the length what we do is depending upon the length we divide it into long segment short segment short segment Cardia metaplasia. Cardia metaplasia, you can see only in the microscopic features. So, only by microscopic features, you can see short and other less than 3 centimeter, long now more than 3 centimeter, long now more than 3 centimeter. So, there are some recent Bailey updates. Okay, write it down Bailey updates. This can be asked as a MCQ for you in your university exam. So, number one is going to be the risk of progression to cancer. Risk of progression to cancer is around 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 percentage per year 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 percentage per year and it increases to 0 0.7 percentage per year for low grade dysplasia for low grade dysplasia low grade dysplasia and when it is going to be a high grade dysplasia, when it is going to be high grade dysplasia, it is going to be around 7%. It is going to be around some 7%. These are the Bailey and Low updates, recent updates. So once you understand this, once you understand this, okay, so it is nothing but a metaplasia, that's all. So the squamous cell and the columnar cells are metaplasia in the junction, gastroesophageal junction, angadam present argo. So in the madri conversion can lead to malignancy. Okay, can lead to malignancy. How do you identify it? So on the identification, okay, we do a test. I at the beginning I told you, right? Chromo endoscopy. I told you chromo endoscopy. Abdingra or a technique I told you. So what happens is you have this methylene blue, lugol iodine. So you have methylene blue, lugol iodine, indu indigo cyanin. Even all are me. When you see, na squamous epithelium, na pink color la arpanga. Ida okay ba pink color la daar ko. Squamous epithelium is usually pink color. Okay ba. So acetic acid add panam bo denna ho na. The loss of whitening will be there. So mostly it will be seen in your Barrett's. Mostly it will be seen in your Barrett's. Telling is when you add a lugol iodine, when you're going to add a lugol iodine to a squamous epithelium, it will be pink in color. They are going to remind. And when you're going to have methylene blue, methylene blue, unstained areas on the uniform methylene blue add panda. Okay, when you're going to add methylene blue, it has to uniformly get stained. Okay, well, if it is going to be not stained or it is not uniformly stained, 
then you suspect for lesion then you suspect for lesion similarly you are going to add acetic acid when you are going to have acetic acid it causes whitening if there is a loss of whitening if there is a loss of whitening then you will be suspecting then you will be suspecting a lesion that lesion most probably it will be a barrett's okay then uh, this is one particular technique you use to differentiate second thing is going to be they have a narrow band imaging narrow band imaging i'll show you the imaging later so you have a narrow band imaging so with that uh, can, uh, can tell you that there is a mucosal lesion that's all but in the classify pannulla ada classify panna var yaar na prag c and m classification prag c and m classification so ivar da vand classify pannaru that is what we are going to see now prag c and m classification okay can you see here so this is your prag c and m classification so what he has told us this is going to be your squamo columnar junction this particular area fully there is going to be a columnar metaplasia and you have esogastro esophagogastric junction so esophagogastric junction la undu ungalku or particular area vandu varaikku there is going to be a there is going to be a squamous metaplasia can you see here so in the squamous metaplasia a irukilla so in the in the range ku agudilla so idha dhaan prag cm criteria nama sonno location of esophagogastric junction is defined by the top of gastric fold 36 cm so top of gastric folds prag criteria of barrett's esophagus are expressed in c circumferential in this case 33 to 36 cm 33 to 36 cm so this is your 33 from 33 to th columnar metaplasia ange da perfect a agudhu can you see here uh, i'll just draw so in the edathula 33 so in the edathula and 36 cm varaikum there is going to be a circumferential lesion therefore this uh, patient therefore has prag c3 m8 barrett's esophagus so maximum extent vandu pathinga na 8 okay maximum extent is this is what we calculate that is 8 cm so in the range vandu it is going to be around uh, the 3 cm so what we tell is c3 circumferential according to uh, according to the circumferential it is going to be 3 and maximum extent is going to be 8 therefore we call it as c3 m8 classification so we call it as c3 m8 okay well, according to the c and m grading of uh, prag we call it as c3 m8 okay c3 m8 nama solluva how do we tell it as c3 and m8 so total lesion vandu evlo nu paakano and uh, c stands for the minimum lesion so minimum na inga edathula nu circumferential it starts so adayu nama measure pandrom ad rendu tha base panni we give the patient as c3 m8 this is a direct image taken from your bailey so till now whatever we read in barrett's esophagus endoscopic examination and biopsy are very crucial so after doing all these things very important thing is going to be you are going to take biopsy biopsy is very very important that biopsy is called as seattle's protocol so you are going to take biopsy that is very important number one after you are going to take a biopsy you are going to confirm it by at least two experienced pathologists and after that what you have you have a two option low grade dysplasia vandana surveillance and ablation high grade dysplasia vandha you have to go for ablation endoscopic resection or esophagectomy that is what we are going to see as a management so this table this table i think uh, everyone has to remember this table okay i'll tell you so one first you are going to find a flat columnar mucosa first you find flat columnar mucosa you are going to do a biopsy okay you are going to do a biopsy there is a procedure for doing a biopsy so how do you do a biopsy i will tell you this is called as a seattle's protocol this is called as seattle's uh, protocol okay this is called as seattle's protocol okay i want you to remember so seattle protocol la enna pandrom four quadrants la nd we are going to take biopsy four quadrants la nd we are going to take biopsy every 2 cm every 2 cm okay va and targeted uh, biopsy from your invasive areas what you are going to do again you are going to targeted so you're going to targeted biopsy okay what you're going to do you're going to go for a targeted biopsy from the you're going to go for a targeted biopsy from the you're going to go for a targeted biopsy from the invasive lesions you're going to go for a targeted biopsy from the invasive lesions biopsy from the invasive lesions is it clear 
So you're going to go for a targeted biopsy from the invasive lesions. Okay, right. Once you understand this, once you understand this, Okay, once you understand this, you're going to take a targeted biopsy, okay, from the targeted lesions. What you're going to do is this, uh, once you identify, once you identify these uh, areas, okay, after taking a biopsy, these areas, you're going to go for a radio ablation. Okay, well, radio ablation you're going to give. Okay, radio ablation is a most commonly used technique. Apart from it, you have this endoscopic mucosal resection. So you also go for endoscopic mucosal resection. Okay, endoscopic mucosal resection is also done. Okay, so this you are you need to remember. Next one, what you are going to remember is uh, uh, this one. Flat columnar mucosa is there. So flat columnar mucosa is going to be there. What you are going to do is. Okay, what you're going to do is you're going to have a flat columnar mucosa. You're going to go for the systemic cold biopsy. You're going to confirm the dysplasia by two independent pathologies. So you have three options. Either no dysplasia, the doctor can give you, the pathologist can give you us no dysplasia. If there is no dysplasia, then repeat OGD every three to five years. Repeat OGD every three to five years. If you, there is no dysplasia, then the maximum length is less than three centimeter. Then it is a gastric metaplasia then repeat OGD. So then repeat OGD. So length is going to be less than 3 cm gastric metaplasia can consider discharging the patient if at all. Okay. Maximum length is less than 3 cm but there is an intestinal metaplasia. Repeat OGD every 3 to 5 years. Very easy. If the maximum length is more than 3 cm, when the maximum length is more than 3 cm, repeat OGD every 2 to 3 years. But in this case, intervention is not done. Next one, inter indefinite for dysplasia. So dysplasia is not done, but there are chances. That's what you said. Okay, well, dysplasia and solar the chance repeat OGD with maximal acid suppression. Once you repeat, then again see whether there is no dysplasia or indefinite for dysplasia. If it is going to be no dysplasia, no problem. But if there is any definite for dysplasia, follow low grade or high grade flowchart. So low grade la low grade dysplasia vanda end up on wing. OGD you're going to do every six months until two consecutive evidence of non-displastic. Uh, if you're going to have no, two barrel cesophagus non-displastic barrett cesophagus so or well a non-displastic barrett cesophagus one that's now follow non-displasia flowchart if at all you're going to have a okay i grade if you're going to have a i grade or if you're going to have a t1a okay t1a yellow esophageal uh, when you're going to get a esophageal adenocarcinoma then what you're going to do then you're going to go for a multidisciplinary dream you're going to go for a therapeutic intervention and endoscopic eradication therapy is followed so clear this uh, this is a newly added figure in your Bailey and Love. I think uh, you can understand this. Again, I will repeat along with you guys. Close your book and just concentrate. Flat mucosal mucosa. You're going to have a flat columnar mucosa. You're going to go for biopsy. After confirmation of two independent pathologies, you're going to say whether it's a no dysplasia, intermediate, indeterminate, or high, low grade or high grade. No dysplasia was then three to five years. Kapra OGD repeat pan la in palaya textbook learned the Pudu textbook la again they divide into a uh, less than three centimeter, less than three centimeter intestinal metaplasia, more than three centimeter short segment, long segment per chana. Gastric uh, metaplasia. Consider discharge. problem Maximum length is going to be less than 3 cm. Intestinal metaplasia on the OGD every 3 to 5 years. If you are going to have maximum length more than 3 cm, repeat every OGD every 2 to 3 years. So when you are going to have indefinite, again you go for a biopsy by acid suppression. So if you are going to see here, if you are going to have a definitive for a Barrett esophagus, then follow your LGD and IGD, HGD. So LGD, low grade dysplasia by So OGD every Six months you're going to do until you find two consecutive evidence of non-displastic Barrett's esophagus. So follow the non-displasia flowchart. If you are going to have OGD every six months, you are going to find 
ஹை கிரேட் டிஸ்பிளேசியா ஆர் டி ஒன் ஏ ஈசபேஜியல் அடினோ கார்சினோமா தென் யூ கோ ஃபார் மல்டி டிசிப்ளினரி டீம் டிஸ்கஷன் தென் தெரப்பட்டிக் இன்டர்வென்ஷன் ஃபாலோட் பை த என்டோஸ்கோபிக் எராடிகேஷன் தெரப்பி சிக்லியா என்டோஸ்கோபிக் எராடிகேஷன் தெரப்பி திஸ் இஸ் வெரி இம்பார்ட்டன் வாட் எவர் யூ ரெட் டில் நவ் திஸ் இஸ் வெரி இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் நவ் வாட் ஆர் த ரிஸ்க் ஃபேக்டர்ஸ் ஓகே டில் நவ் சிக்லியா வி ஹவ் கம்ப்ளீட்டட் த ப்ரோட்டோகால் வி ஹவ் கம்ப்ளீட்டட் த பேரட்ஸ் இஸ் ஆஃப் ஸ்ராக்ஸ் கிரைட்டீரியா வி ஹவ் கம்ப்ளீட்டட் த மேனேஜ்மெண்ட் ஃப்ளோ சார்ட் ஓகே இதை தவிர வேற எதுவுமே இதுல இருந்து கேட்க மாட்டாங்க so next we are going to move towards a very important topic we are going to move towards the okay esophageal cancer next topic what we are going to discuss is esophageal cancer is it clear can we move towards esophageal cancer okay the objectives of this discussion one we have to know the work up for your barrett's esophagus second thing is your barium finding third one gastroesophageal junction tumors then you have to know cms okay cms what i will tell you esophageal replacement and management of esophageal leiomyoma okay the first thing is going to be what we are going to discuss is the uh, risk factors of your uh, esophageal cancers so what are the risk factors for esophageal cancer so risk factors pathona number one is your cigarette smoking so remember squamous cell carcinoma is a most common squamous cell carcinoma is a most common and location is going to be present in the middle one third location is going to be present in the middle one third so remember again i will repeat so this is going to be a most common it is present in the middle one third it is present in the middle one third and uh, risk factors are including smoking uh, alcohol you have your smoked food so when you going to intake a smoked food or when there is aclasia cardia any uh, tylosis autoimmune disease so tylosis is uh, autoimmune so autoimmune disease autoimmune disease okay tylosis is a autoimmune disease guys tylosis is autoimmune disease and you have this human papilloma virus infection in nitrosamine and you have this plummer vinson syndrome you have plummer vinson plummer vinson syndrome i want you to add this okay so you have this plummer vincent disease and all these things are very important zenkers diverticulum you have corrosive injuries all these things similarly in adenocarcinoma this is most common in the western world so this is most common in western world okay it's a most common in your western world and location is going to be lower one third so location enga na lower one third risk factors are going to be including again smoking alcohol grd crest syndrome barrett esophagus all these things are including so h pylori is going to be a protective against the adenocarcinoma a very very important point so h pylori is a protective point so it decreases the risk of adenocarcinoma this is a recent advance okay h pylori decreases the risk of uh, adenocarcinoma and most common in india is going to be squamous cell carcinoma most common in the western world it is going to be adenocarcinoma okay what are going to be the clinical features what are going to be the clinical features which you are going to see okay the clinical features include clinical features are going to be including number 1 there is going to be a progressive dysphagia progressive dysphagia progressive dysphagia number 1 there is going to be a progressive dysphagia and number 2 what happens is when there is a progressive dysphagia there will be a uh, weight loss okay va dysphagia irukumbod automatically enna agum there will be a weight loss that is very important third thing is going to be this progressive dysphagia i told right this dysphagia actually it will be more common for the solid than the liquid so solid more than liquid this one i want you to write it down put a star so poor there will be a progressive dysphagia but this dysphagia will be more towards solid than your liquid more towards your solid than your liquid obesity is also a protective factor guys remember obesity is also a protective factor and uh, you can have this uh, progressive uh, dysphagia in three conditions number 1 ca esophagus number 2 you can see in the aclasia cardia aclasia cardia and number 3 is going to be you see in the stricture esophagus in the stricture esophagus 
you see this in the three important conditions. So these three conditions you will be seeing. And then uh, you have the Zenka's diverticulum and your uh, hypercontractile esophagus. Right? So you can have a chest pain and dysphagia. Okay, next what you're going to see is the third important point is there will be a orusness of voice. Yeah, orusness of voice where they can mm -hmm. someone tell me we have already discussed this in anatomy. So you know that right recurrent laryngeal nerve. They pass in the tracheoesophageal uh, fissure. Okay, therefore any uh, compression because of the tumor in the esophagus can lead to compression of recurrent laryngeal nerve. So in the left recurrent laryngeal nerve and because of it there is going to be a chronic cough. Chronic cough will be there. Okay. There will be a left recurrent laryngeal nerve. There will be orusness of voice will be there. Now investigation of choice. What is the investigation of choice? PET CT. Okay. You go for PET CT. That is the investigation of choice. If you are going to ask me the investigation of choice for T staging. For T staging, investigation of choice is going to be endoscopic ultrasound. Okay, endoscopic ultrasound is going to be the investigation of choice for T staging. Okay, wa is like that doubt rakai do erikyo. Okay, so next what you are going to understand is you need to understand the uh, what is going to be the uh, feature which we are going to see in the endoscopic ultrasound and what is going to be the feature you are going to see in a normal barium swallow X-ray. For normal barium swallow X-ray edu thalo me adile ori important. My, we, uh, we can identify what is that I will explain you and before moving to that I also want you to explain the uh, I also wanted to explain what are the lymph node metastasis that is possible so when I am going to talk about the lymph node metastasis very clearly I will tell you so this is a most common spread so lymph node metastasis is a most common spread and they are going to be they are going to be spread through submucosal so they spread submucosal and uh, cranial caudal to cranial it goes like this caudal uh, to cranial okay similarly you can, uh, blood blood le image it can uh, actually like uh, spread so blood le vandha pathina liver more than your lung okay so this once you understand next one what we are going to see is going to be the yeah, we are going to see the how it will be appearing. Can you see uh, this is your endoscopic ultrasonogram. So normally how it will be there is you can see a mucosa, submucosa, muscle layer and serosa. This is how it appears. But in esophageal carcinoma, they are going to penetrate through your esophagus. They are going to be penetrating through your esophagus and can you see here. So all these things are your tumors. All these things are your tumors, all this white color thing, whatever you are seeing. So all these are going to be tumors and this is not having a concentric circle, target sign like appearance is missing. Okay, similarly, uh, you can see a bird peak like appearance. So uh, you have a bird peak like appearance. Can you see uh, this is going to be your bird peak like appearance. Bird peak appearance. This is going to be a bird peak appearance. And according to the TNM staging, we divide into T1, T2, T3, T4. So I told you already this T staging, which is important, T staging, you need endoscopic ultrasound. T staging, endoscopic ultrasound this must. So now looking into this T staging one by one, can you look into the T staging one by one? Tx stands for tumor that cannot be accessed and T0 is no evidence of primary tumor and Tis is in situ and T1 is invasion into the lamina propria muscularis mucosa or submucosa. Okay, ma. so meaning in mucosa submucosa mutana pogodi. You know, muscular is proper yakupogala. T1 nale invasion into the mucosa and submucosa. But what happened is, according to the recent uh, changes in your uh, textbook, T1A stands for lamina propria and T1B stands for submucosa. And T2 and the muscular is propria, T3 adventitia and T4 adjacent structures. Adalia vandu, when it is invades pleura, pericardium, azagas vein it is T4A and uh, iota vertebral body trachea it is T4B but I will tell you guys remember this classification is not necessary it is not necessary for your exam so exam preparation what you need to understand is T staging irukku, adhiki endoscopic ultrasound adhi base pane T1, T2, T3, T4 nu pirikino. T1 submucosa, T2 muscularis mucosa propria, T3 adventitia, T4 adjacent structures. Avala tha, idhi mattu thang thirikino, adhi nada na oru picture kutthi rikai, in the picture of base pane yeah, you can read, okay va. So without anything else, just this picture is enough. So, endoscopic, okay. So, ipa 
இதுதான் உங்களோட ப்ரூவ் ஸோ ப்ரூவ் உள்ள போடுறப்ப ஃபர்ஸ்ட் இருக்கிறது வாட் இஸ் திஸ் திஸ் இஸ் கோயிங் டு பி யோர் ஈசஃபேகஸ் ஸோ ஈசஃபேகஸ் சுத்தி சீரோஸா எல்லாமே இருக்கணும் பட் என்னன்னா ஒரு கான்சென்ட்ரிக்கா ரவுண்டா டைரக்டா இல்லாம ஒரு கான்சென்ட்ரிக்கா சர்க்கிள்ஸ் அங்கங்க வருது சர்க்கிள்ஸ் இருந்தாலும் தட் இஸ் கோயிங் டு ஃபார்ம் டியூமர் அண்ட் வென் யூ கோயிங் டு கோ த்ரூ திஸ் அந்த டியூமர் எங்க இருக்கும் அதை சரௌண்டிங்னா தேர் இல் பி அ ஷேடோ கேன் யூ சியர் ஸோ இந்த டியூமருக்கு டியூமர் சரவுண்ட் பண்ணி ஷேடோ இருக்கும் அண்ட் அயோட்டால கூட இட் கேன் கோ அண்ட் இட் கேன் ரீச் ஸோ யூ ஹவ் யுவர் அயோட்டா ஸோ அயோட்டாக்கு இந்த இன்வேஷன் ஆஃப் யுவர் இசபேஜியல் கேன்சர் கேன் கோ ஸோ அதுதான் நம்ம இங்கே சொல்ல வரும் அது மட்டுமே போதும் ஓகேவா ஸோ பேர்ட் பீக் அப்பியரன்ஸ் ஐ ஹோப் ஸோ யூ அண்டர்ஸ்டூட் திஸ் இஸ் அண்டர்ஸ்கோபிக் பிக்சர் ஆஃப் இசபேஜியல் டியூமர் ஸோ கேன் ஏ சியர் வேர் இஸ் இசபேஜியல் டியூமர் கேன் சம் ஒன் ஐடென்டிஃபை அட் சிக்ஸ் ஓ கிளாக் டு நைன் ஓ கிளாக் பொசிஷன் கேன் யூ சி at 6 to 9 o'clock position can you see in that place enlarged a irukka so idellame concentric a vandirukku ana inda edathula mattum enlarged a irukku so this is going to be eccentric with extra esophageal invasion esophagus so this is your iota this is your iota so extra esophageal invasions are going to be present in this and this what is this can someone tell me this is your bird peak appearance ah uh, is this bird peak appearance is this your bird peak appearance then what is this is the bird peak appearance then are you sure yes it is a bird peak appearance appa rat tail appearance eppadi irukum appa rat tail appearance eppadi irukum come on i want you to answer that is what i i was thinking whether someone will be correcting me but of course no one corrected me this is actually your shouldering effect can you see here there is a shouldering effect here can you see here? there is a shouldering effect so shouldering effect is not seen in the bird peak appearance shouldering peak will be seen in the rat tail appearance it's looking like a tail can you see here this looks like a tail okay this is rat tail appearance this rat tail appearance you see in the carcinoma esophagus adukada in the picture pota can you see here this is your bird peak appearance this is your bird peak appearance bird peak appearance you see in the aclasia cardia this is seen in the aclasia cardia now listen to me carefully again once again make your mind very well so bird peak appearance seen in the aclasia cardia rat tail appearance seen in the esophagus cancer rat tail appearance now ungalku tail maadhiri irukum bird peak appearance now ungalku perusa irukum esophagus or chinna edathula or tailing varum avladha so adhu vande we call it as bird's peak appearance idu rat tail appearance rat tail appearance na cancer irukku so can you see here so all these are cancer areas so adu abbe in pannudhu ungala esophagus ah compress pannudhu okay va so this i want you to remember and next is going to be this one this image is nothing but this is your seward's okay seward's tumor this is called as seward's tumor okay va so this is going to be at the gastroesophageal junction this is going to be present in the gastroesophageal junction so you have four types type 1 is going to be 5 cm okay 5 plus 1 6 cm so 6 cm from your anatomical cardia from your anatomical cardia that is going gastroesophageal junction from here you are going to have till 6 cm that is going to be your type 1 okay type uh, type 1 is or indu vand 1 cm is going to be your type 2 so in the part la irundha adu type 2 idu vand esophageal part nu solluvom idu unga gastric part yen gastric part solrona esophagus oda surgical anatomy padi esophagus is already over surgical anatomy but esophagus is already over at the uh, 1 cm itself so adikapramae gastric start agudha ad gastric nu solrom okay va so third one vandu paathinga na it is going to be fully gastric okay third one is going fully gastric idu gastroesophageal junction area okay va so gastroesophageal junction area but anatomically nama paathona we can actually include this also so 1 and 2 seethe nama esophagus nu solrom 3 vandu gastric nu solrom but surgically it differs okay i already told you that is and the first point itself so surgically what you are going to so in the proximal margin 10 cm irundalo distal margin 5 cm irundalo you go for esophagectomy so since lymph node runs longitudinally there can be a skip lesions so inge vand lymph node is going to run longitudinally they will be having a 
skip lesions. They will be having skip lesions. Okay. Surgically, proximal margin 10 cm, distal margin 5 cm. And the minimum nodes you have to remove is 15 nodes you have to remove. Minimum nodes you are going to remove is 15 nodes you are going to remove. And then management, I want to add the recent updates. So let's see the recent updates uh, of Bailey. Okay, recent updates of Bailey. So T1, what we did is T1, we characterized into T1A, T2A. In your uh, T staging. T1A, it is just lamina propria. Lamina propria or muscularis mucosa. Muscularis mucosa. T1B, T1B. T1B is nothing but it invades submucosa. And T4 is also divided into T4A, direct invasion. T4A is direct invasion of peritoneum. Peritoneum. Okay, wa? and G4 is grade. Histological grading. But G4 is well differentiated, moderately differentiated, poorly differentiated. G4 is a concept removed. Cancer of esophagogastric junction that have their epicenters within proximal 2 cm are staged as esophageal cancer. Those with epicenters more than 2 cm, distal to esophagogastric junction, they are staged in the 7th edition as esophageal junction cancer, even if the esophagus is involved or staged in the stomach cancer. So, when the distal end, when the distal end is more than 2 cm, even though your esophagus is removed, you take it as a stomach cancer, you take it as a stomach cancer. This is what your Bailey and Lowe tells. Okay, so in the end point, may you need to understand these are the recent advances. Next, moving on towards the surgery. Next, I am going to move on towards the surgery. So, surgery, there is actually three types of surgery. Number one, you have this Oringer. Number two, you have this Ivor Levis. Ivor Levis. And number three, you are going to have Mekki Won. Mekki Won. So, Oringer, Ivor Levis, Mekki Won. Moon Oringer, Oringer na na transkiatal. Oringer abna na is a transkiatal. Okay, write it down. Oringer is nothing but transkiatal. Transkiatal. Idu vandu pathanga lower one third involvement, lower one third involvement, middle one third involvement, middle one third involvement, lower one third involvement, middle one third involvement. Rendu dina. Yevulo incision porvenga na rend incision porvenga. Oringer, transiatal. We call it as transiatal. Okay, wow. so how many incisions you will be giving? Two incisions. So you will be giving two incisions. Okay, wow. so where you will be giving incision? At midline, at midline abdomen, at midline abdomen and neck. Okay, wow. two incision you will be going with midline abdomen or neck and site of anastomosis. Where do you anastomose? You will be giving anastomosis at the neck. Okay, wow. you will be giving anastomosis at the neck. One is esophagectomy. Pandro. So, you will surgery pandro. esophagectomy. So, you are going to remove esophagus. You will esophagectomy. Pandro. This is the incision. This is the lower one third, middle one third. When it is going to be at the middle one third and middle one third is going to be involved more commonly. Abdina. Middle one third involved more commonly. Abdina. You again give two incision but where do you give incision you're going to give incision at abdomen you're going to give incision at abdomen and right thoracotomy thoracotomy okay wow. so anastomosis will be at thorax okay wow. next one and then mechion mechion when the pathing it's a three field so upper one third so when it is going to involve upper one third they go for mechi one okay wow. so you will be giving three incision you will be giving three incisions so where all you will be giving incision abdomen and left right thorax abdomen and left and right thorax you will be giving so this in the anastomosis will be also at the neck anastomosis will be also at the neck okay wow. so anastomosis will be also at the neck so you can go for wide excision 10 centimeter primary proximal 10 centimeter distal 5 centimeter so how you give uh, incision so how you excise the patient so excision on the now what we will do is Three uh, more than three spy, more than ten centimeter. So ten centimeter proximal agu, and five centimeter distal agu you will do. Okay, and you will also go for regional lymphadenectomy. Lymphadenectomy. 
lymphadenectomy, adenectomy. You will do lymphadenectomy. This is very important. Okay, you go for a lymphadenectomy. As the squamous cell carcinoma has early spread to lymph node, either Lewis Tanner or three field approach is preferred. So three field approach for the Roman allergy. Okay, wa? so lower one third and middle one third carcinoma on the either Lewis Tanner and lower one third motor and transiatal. Okay, lower one third one the main and then you go for transiatal. What is going to be the complication? So remember, most common complication. What is going to be the most common complication? Most common complication is going to be your pulmonary complication. Pulmonary complication. Okay, pulmonary complication. And most common cause of mortality. So most common cause of mortality in and pathona, your anastomotic leakage. Anastomotic leakage is going to be the most common cause and long term complication long term complication when you're going to go forward it is going to be anastomatic stricture anastomatic stricture is the most common cause most common cause is anastomotic stricture endoscopic mucosal resection type t1a t1a you go for endoscopic mucosal resection now most common esophageal replacement Okay, gastric tube. So, why, how will you replace the esophagus? By replacing the gastric tube based on right gastroepiploic vessels and right gastric vessels. Okay, well, if stomach is affected, then what you will do? You will keep the colon as the replacement. So, apart from it, you have the chemotherapy and radiotherapy also. Chemotherapy, radiotherapy, lamo, you usually give. So, chemotherapy, what will be your chemotherapeutic agent? Chemotherapeutic agent is going to be a combined. Either you can go for a neoadjuvant or you can go for the adjuvant chemotherapy. Therapy. So, which is going to be the most common prognostic factor? Most common prognostic factor. Most common prognostic factor is going to be depth of invasion. Depth of invasion is the most common prognostic factor. If it is malignant, TEF, then palliative surgery you do. If it's a TEF, then you are going to go for the palliative treatment. Palliative treatment and a combination. You go for a combination. And laser treatment, if you're going to go, you use a NDAG laser. NDAG laser you will be using. And conduit placement. Conduit placement on the pathagana, most common you go for the gastric conduit placement gastric conduit placement now you go for right gastroepiploic artery left gastroepiploic artery and you have this right gastric artery right gastric artery right gastric artery so gastroepiploic artery and right gastric artery so conduit of choice in ca esophagus will always be conduit of choice will always be conduit of choice will always be your stomach Okay, will always be your stomach. And if they ask you best content, that is also your stomach. If they ask you most commonly used content, most commonly used content, that is also your stomach. Shortest route, if you're going to ask me, shortest route, if you're going to ask me, it is posterior mediastinum. Posterior mediastinum. So there are some important updates which you need to know. Again, I am repeating. There are some updates which have uh, come forward in the recent times. So left thoracic approach is called a sweet epigastro esophagectomy. So left thoracic wave, left thoracic wave, that is called as sweet epigastro esophagectomy. So sweet esophagos. To me, phagectomy, phaiso, phagectomy. Okay, wa well, laparoscopic and thoracic resection is called as VATS. Okay, laparoscopic or thoracic resection, thoracic resection. This is called as resection is called as VATS, VATS. Okay, and transiatal esophagectomy is important, stomach esophagectomy is important. And apart from all these things, what you need to understand is two field lymphadenectomy. Standard on your pandra what you are going to do is you are going to remove the lymph node also. Three field lymphadenectomy, not two field plus cervical. What you are going to do, and minimum 15 lymph nodes has to be removed. Minimum 15 lymph nodes has to be removed. And one more important updates which have been there in your textbook is going to be self expanding metallic stent. Okay, self expanding metallic stent. So, what is SEMS? So this was asked once. Okay, this was asked once. That's why I'm just wanted to tell you. This was asked once. Kindly remember SEMS. What is SEMS? It is nothing but a self expanding metallic stent. Metallic stent. Okay, self expanding metallic stent. So why we use this? We use this if if there is a TEF. 
so when there is a malignancy along with this there is a tef you go for self expanding malignant stent will be used so most common complication most common complication of this okay is going to be migration of stent migration of stent so this is going to be the most common complication migration of stent okay va illa da doubt iruka so what we will do is we will just uh, go through this image okay va i'll just show you a image just go through it so this is going to be a self expanding metallic stent when you are going to keep the self expanding metallic stent what happens is can you see there is a expansion there is a expansion this phase will be reduced because of that we are actually using and can you see here this is again uh, what is this can someone tell what is this image there is a bleeding isn't it so when there is a bleeding when there is a perforation so one of the common complication of uh, all your treatment is going to be your perforation that is what we will be seeing in the next part okay so till this what you need to understand is acm you have to understand then what are the prognostic factor prognostic factor is going to be depth of invasion next we are going to move towards the leomyoma leomyoma okay so when you going to talk about this leomyoma it's going to be the most common benign tumor it's a most common benign tumor that you need to understand and they are going to have a punched out appearance punched out appearance you're going to have punched out appearance okay and then what is going to be the management management is going to be e nucleation management is going to be e nucleation i want you to remember this these three points are more than enough treatment is going to be you go for ster submucosal tunneling endoscopic resection submucosal tunneling endoscopic resection submucosal tunneling endoscopic resection will be what performed okay va submucosal endoscopic tunneling will be performed in this condition okay next you have to understand the esophageal perforation next what we are going to go for we are going to go for the esophageal perforation can we go into the esophageal perforation guys yes so esophageal perforation pathi nama paathona very important so post endoscopic okay renda nama perikala esophageal perforations okay it can be either it can be due to iatrogenic either it can be due to iatrogenic in nature okay or it can be uh, due to your spontaneous either it can be spontaneous uh, like your borevis syndrome borevi syndrome okay borevis syndrome okay iatrogenic la vande post endoscopic number 1 it can be post endoscopic endoscopic okay va so increased risk enga increased risk irukum okay in case of therapeutic in case of a cancer okay all this areas you have this post endoscopic you have problem most common type most common type of esophageal uh, perforation is going to be your uh, iatrogenic iatrogenic the most common type now coming towards your clinical features clinical features when the okay number 1 there is going to be chest pain there is going to be chest pain number 1 number 2 you are going to have uh, sepsis okay chest pain sepsis is present uh, and uh, what is going to be the investigation of choice investigation of choice you go for cect abdomen cect abdomen and thorax cect abdomen and thorax is the investigation of choice cect abdomen and thorax is going to be the investigation of choice very very important okay then coming towards if it is unstable if unstable patient are na na then you go for contrast study then you go for contrast study now coming towards the management very important management enna na renda nama pirikala number 1 majority of this cases majority of this cases will be stable majority of the patient will be stable they have small perforation small perforation will be there so on the my cases what you do is you go for npo you go for iv fluid then you go for your uh, iv fluid then you go for your pain control okay antibiotics iv antibiotics can be given then you go for the pain control so then you go for pain control okay va so adutha vandu pathena sila cases la they can move towards sepsis so sepsis irukra cases la you go for endoscopic banding endoscopic banding has to be done okay and then you have to repair the perforation repair the perforation repair the perforation this is going to be apart from it you have to carry out all the routine procedures okay all the routine procedures has to be carried out next one vandu padagana spontaneous okay bear of uh, syndrome pathach next one vandu padagana what you have to understand next one after completing this uh, what you have to understand is going to be your 
spontaneous about your boras. So this is most common in the alcoholic patient. In alcoholic patients, it's going to be the most common. It occurs after forceful vomiting. So it occurs after forceful vomiting. Forceful vomiting. Okay, so clinical features, again, it is going to be a chest pain. Okay, and they will be having a retching. They will be having retching. And you have a subcutaneous emphysema. Subcutaneous emphysema is present. Emphysema is present. So what is going to be your on examination? You can actually examine, auscultate the art. Okay, auscultate art. This is number one. Number two, you can see a crunching sound. Crunching, crunching sound can be visualized crunching sound can be visualized that is called as omen's crunch omen's crunch investigation of choice will be your left po posterior lateral wall so in the left posterior lateral wall you are going to see so c c t panni paakrenga okay stable patient na c c t pandrenga unstable patient ah irundanga na contrast okay contrast study in case of unstable patient so, what is the most common site where you can find? So, most common site you're going to find is going to be your left posterior lateral. Left posterior lateral is a place where you're going to find. Okay. And especially lower one third, lower one third, you're going to find. Okay, left uh, lower one third layer you're going to find uh, and pneumomediastinum. So what you will be finding? Pneumomediastinum. Mediastinum. Okay, and on X-ray, what you're going to find? On X-ray, you're going to find three signs. Number one, continuous diaphragm sign. Diaphragm sign. Continuous diaphragm sign is number one. Number two, you're going to have your spinnaker. Spinnaker sign. Number two, you have spinnaker sign. Number three, you have your jinko leaf sign. Jinko leaf sign. Okay, wow. so spinnaker sign, jinko leaf sign. These are the three important features which you're going to find. Three important features which you're going to find. And what is going to be the objective for these patients? So, okay, so objective for these patients, if you're going to ask me, cervical esophageal and pharyngeal perforation are usually much uh, less septic than those of intrathoracic perforation. Stable patient, not conservative management. What will be the objective? Okay, objective for both. Okay, what is the management objective for both? That's what my question is. First, you're going to seal the perforation. Seal the perforation first you are going to seal the perforation number two adequate drainage adequate drainage okay adequate drainage is very much important number three nutritional support number three nutritional support you are going to derive and number four is going to be endoscopic sealing endoscopic sealing should be done and number five you give t tube t tube placement t tube placement is done and number six Cervical lymphadenopathy, lymphadenopathy, which is nowadays not done, not done nowadays. Okay, well, so this is going to be the objective of both the conditions. Okay, well, objective of both the condition is this only. And uh, with this, we are completing the Barrett's esophagus and your uh, Barrett's esophagus is over, esophageal cancer is over. Next, we have also completed uh, perforations. So finally, uh, Acclesia cardia. So after completing your Barrett's esophagus, esophageal cancer and all those important topics, now we are left with one small topics uh, that includes Acclesia. So Acclesia cardia is a very important topic. What is Acclesia cardia? So, Acclesia cardia is a loss of ganglionic cell in the lower part of your esophagus, in your oil batch and meantric plexus. So, lower one third is not contracting and your lower esophageal sphincter is not responding. So, you are responding and relax. Okay, wow. So, lower esophageal sphincter relax. And uh, we classify this as primary, secondary. So primary na, na, disease when the primary uh, because of some problem in the esophageal ganglionic cell itself that uh, idiopathic in nature. So we don't know exact cause, but secondary causes we have many. Number one is going to be the commonest secondary cause if you're going to tell me. Or when you're going to call directly a secondary acclesia, you call Chagas disease. What is Chagas disease? Trypanosoma cruzi. Trypanosoma cruzi is called as your Chagas disease. And the second thing is going to be carcinoma. So carcinoma, we call it as pseudo -achlasia. And uh, we also have this amyloidosis, post-vagotomy uh, post, uh, stage. So after vagotomy surgery, post-vagotomy stage would be there. 
and i am going to tell about the chicago 4.0 classification before moving into the chicago 4.0 classification what i would like you to know is i just want you to recall the manometry which we have discussed earlier i hope you all recall that manometry which we discussed earlier what is a manometry manometry is a high uh, resolution manometry which we uh, currently use this high resolution manometry is something that is commonly used nowadays especially to identify the abnormalities that are going to be present the abnormalities that are going to be present in the in the movement or in the motility disorders specifically in motility disorders we usually use this uh, characteristic uh, character and adu vandu pathinga main ah nama eda use pandrom appadina we use chicago classification so what do we use we use chicago classification so chicago classification we have type 1 type 2 type 3 three type of classification okay this is chicago chicago 4.0 so we call this as chicago 4.0 classification so type 1 is nothing but aclasia classic so here you have a abnormal irp what is irp stands for integrated relaxation pressure which corresponds to the mean pressure of greatest post deglutitive relaxation adavadu saapte mudichadukapra relaxation phase pogum la appa irukka koodiya mean pressure in a 10 second gap triggered at the beginning of swallowing okay va so on the 10 seconds gap la what you are going to see that is called as irp this is going to be abnormal in type 1 aclasia type 2 aclasia as well as type 3 aclasia ana type 1 layum 100% failed peristalsis type 2 li 100% failed peristalsis type 3 li 100% failed peristalsis what changes is in type 2 there is a pan esophageal pressurization what is pan esophageal pressurization the entire esophagus pressure is going to be abnormal okay in classic it's going to be one part and type 3 is there is a spastic contraction in addition to the pan esophageal pressurization with dci more than 450 mm of mercury okay dci uh, 450 mm of mercury is it clear okay so your dci stands for distal contractile integral what is distal contractile integral it is an index it is an index of contractile vigor and it is calculated as a product of amplitude duration and span of distal esophageal contraction okay what is a distal contractile integral it's a integral it's a index of a contractile vigor evlo contraction irukku abdingaradhu namma measure pandrathu adoda contraction undu pathinga more than 450 mm of mercury okay va so contraction bayangaram irukku so adha da inda spastic contraction phase abdin solra idhu or question actually they asked and uh, coming to the disorder of peristalsis so all these things are disorder of your gastroesophageal junction obstruction that is your type uh, first types what we discussed and disorder of peristalsis we have two things one is your diffuse esophageal spasm you uh, get a uh, you get a spastic appearance i'll show you the x ray image there what you have is irpn irp is nothing but your integrated pressure uh, in relaxation pressure and that is going to be normal over there and uh, abno non peristaltic contraction will be there premature contraction will be there and dci more than again 450 mm of mercury you have another one called as nutcracker esophagus which we will be discussing in short time so there you have normal peristalsis but what happens here is increased duration of peristalsis occurs with contraction of more than 8000 mm of mercury okay ma 8000 mm of mercury that's what uh, that's the importance over there and uh, if you see this is actually one of the uh, algorithm of your esophageal motility disorders i thought why don't you understand this so that it will be very easy for you for understanding so perform a swallowing okay ma 10 seconds swallowing ninga perform pandreenga okay so appa and mai pra ma pannum bodu what do you get what do you get so you have this irp integrated relaxation pressure and the integrated relaxation pressure if it is going to be abnormal okay if it is going to be abnormal then 100% absent of peristalsis occurs okay adikapra ninga enna paakreenga rendavathu point 100% failed peristalsis irukka nu paakreenga apdi irundaduna okay without pcp ya with po pcp ya so apdi ninga paakreenga what is what is that pan esophageal pressurization irukka nu paakreenga pan esophageal pressurization irundha aclasia type 1 
டாமினேஷன் பெரிஸ்டால் ப்ரெஷரைசேஷன் இருக்கா இல்லையான்னு பாக்குறீங்க இல்லைன்னா அது அக்லேஷா டைப் ஒன் இருந்ததுன்னா டைப் டூ டைப் த்ரீயா இருக்கலாம் டைப் டூ அண்ட் டைப் த்ரீக்கு டிஃபரன்ஸ் நான் என்ன சொன்னேன் வித் ப்ரீ மெச்சூர் கான்ட்ராக்ஷன் வித் பிளாஸ்டிக் கான்ட்ராக்ஷன் இருந்ததுன்னா அது டைப் த்ரீ இல்லைன்னா அது டைப் டூ ஸோ இப்போ அக்லேஷியாவோட மூணு பாயிண்ட் டிஃபரன்ஷியேட் பண்றதுல யூ ஓன்ட் ஹவ் எனி ப்ராப்ளம் ஐ பிலீவ் second thing what you are going to see if if at all 100% peristalsis is not there or it cannot be done abdina okay you go for the is there you go for to check any evidence for the obstruction is there or not edume illa or abnormal median irp illa normal median irp irukku abdina adu vand either it is going to be a nutcracker esophagus or it is going to be a diffuse esophageal spasm so simple okay va so simplest tabla column simple they are explaining so now you already know the types now i already told you this is very simplified table type 1 na classic type 2 ngada type 1 plus panesophageal pressurization type 3 ngada type 2 plus premature spastic contraction then you have this one particular scoring that is called as ectard scoring what is ectard scoring my dear listen to me ectard scoring is nothing but okay so ectard scoring is, is my screen visible uh, just a minute yeah ectard scoring ectard scoring is nothing but what you have to remember here is not those values there are 0 1 2 3 4 gradings plus what are the components so this will be asked as a question so i remember it as wdrr so w stands for weight loss d stands for dysphagia r stands for retrosternal pain and regurgitation if you see the classical features if you see the classical features of the uh, you are uh, Aklesha itself is going to be having a triad. What triad? Dysphagia, regurgitation and weight loss. You won't have this retrosternal pain alone in the classical triad. But anyway, classical scoring system is going to include all the four components. Is it clear? Okay. Now, moving on towards the pathophysiology. So, loss of the inhibitory myentric plexus. So, myentric neurons are inhibit pandra and the mechanism loss agadhi. So, that's why we have to say that lower esophageal sphincter will be failing to relax. So, lower esophageal sphincter will be failing to relax. But, the tone will be increased. There will be a weak or abnormal peristalsis because there is a forward propulsion. And intra-esophageal pressure will be more. Okay, intra-esophageal pressure will be more. Okay, wow. intra-esophageal pressure will be more and that leads to this. And you know the clinical feature triad. Retrosternal pain is one of the components. So that also you know retrosternal pain is going to be one of the components. Then what you have is your postnatal uh, prandial choking will be there. Nocturnal cough will be there. And these are the clinical features which you need to understand. Then coming towards the complication, guys, listen to me. Complication, aspiration, pneumonitis and lung abscess are the common complications which you are going to witness. And... Uh, what basically happens is the investigation of choice which we are going to do is your uh, esophageal manometry i will discuss about this esophageal manometry shortly but before moving to that understand while you are going to give a barium swallow you will have this bird peak appearance you already know esophagus it is going to be a rat tail appearance whereas here you are going to have a bird peak appearance okay and what is going to be the treatment of choice treatment of choice is going to be management with the uh, betox injection but what happens is betox injection if you are going to use the recurrence rate is very more okay but uh, you can uh, otherwise go for a pneumotic dilatation pneumatic dilatation factors which are going to be predicting the response are older than 45 years age group female undilated esophagus and uh, when there is a uh, aklesia okay t2 aklesia all these things can lead to and what is going to be your treatment of choice treatment of choice is going to be lr myotomy what do you do in lr myotomy you actually go for the submucosa so submucosa la apdi nam poite nam enna pandrona and the edathila irukkakoodiya and the lower esophageal submucosa kum taandi muscularis propria poite muscle dana ungalku inge vande relax aaga matigidha and the lower esophageal sphincter area la so nam enna pandrona and the muscle la we are going to just cut it down now we are going to trim it down so and the my trim pannum bodu what happens is you can actually have a good pathway for the movement okay so that is the treatment uh, which is then apart from this lr myotomy what you also do is you can go for this poem poem okay you can actually go for this poem just write it down lr myotomy when do you do lr myotomy i want you all to remember this 6 cm proximal to 2 to 3 cm distal so, so when do you do just write it down when do you do when you have 6 cm proximal 
six centimeter proximal and two to three centimeter distal two to three centimeter distal okay surgical outcomes are big uh, it's going to be good in the l type one and type two and you have this one more uh, surgery you have one more surgery that is going to be your poem what is poem we discussed already in the esophageal cancer poem stands for your percutaneous esophageal endoscopic uh, what is endoscopic someone what does poem stands for I'll wait, I'll wait. No problem for me. I just want everyone to answer in the chat box. What is POEM? Where did we read this POEM? We read this POEM at last in the GERD also. We read in the Barrett's esophagus specifically. We read POEM. Can you all remember? Can you all recollect where did you read POEM or what is the full form of POEM? I just want the full form of POEM from you all. That's all. What is PREM? POEM, sorry. Someone, I, I will wait, I will wait, I will give you ample of time. Just go back, just check and tell me what, where did we read POEM or for what POEM is done. Okay, so hope you all did, don't remember what we discussed uh, in the last uh, few hours. You don't remember what we discussed in the last few hours, isn't it? I'll give you a clue. POEM is nothing but they are circular. Uh, you're going to cut down the muscle. Okay. Percutaneous. What is POEM? Percutaneous. Percutaneous. Esophageal. Endoscopic. I have left only one word, dude. One word is also in this uh, screen itself. Myotomy. Exactly. Percutaneous, esophageal, endoscopic myotomy. It is the full form. And it is uh, one of the type of your notes. What is N-O-T-E-S? Non-invasive, oral. What is notes? Non-esophageal. I want answer. I want answer, please. Non-esophageal. Oh, sorry. Non-invasive. It's a non-invasive procedure. You go from your oral route. Is only oral route is considered? Of course, no. Then what it is considered? Okay, I'll tell you the answer now. But uh, please, please just recall whatever you are discussing. Please recall. That is very much important. It's a natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery. Natural RFS transluminal endoscopic surgery notes. It is a procedure where you are going to, what you are going to do, where it's an experimental procedure, where you are going to go through the natural RFS. Any surgery, what you are going to do, you are going to have a flexible endoscope. You are going to use a flexible endoscope through the natural RFS. Why you are doing that? Because you wanted to avoid. Why you are doing that? Because you wanted to avoid the uh, incisions. Okay, you wanted to avoid the incision and that is why you are doing by this notes route. Okay, okay. so I will uh, now tell you about this manometry. Okay, what is this manometry guys? I told you already at the beginning of the first session, we were discussing about the manometry, isn't it? So manometry is uh, actually used for uh, measuring the motility. Okay, gut motility a measure under the number one and number two is like a third important process of it is going to be your... Uh, for measuring the pressure in the sphincters. So now listen to me, this uh, question taken from uh, Maru. Uh, I think uh, th I found this as very uh, interesting question. That is why I just uh, took it as a slide. So a young woman was admitted with the chief complaints of dysphagia. So dysphagia since adulthood. Last three months, odinophagia, nausea, vomiting, undigested food. Barium swallow showed features so suspicious of achalasia. Now they have told you achalasia. She is advised to undergo esophageal manometry. Which of the following will not be seen? Actually, even if you don't understand the manometry, you can tell this answer for this question. So LES pressure is high. Of course, LES pressure will be high. Then only you call it as a... Then only you call it as a achalasia. Decreased LES relaxation. Yes, there will be decreased LES relaxation. Decreased esophageal baseline pressure. If there is a decrease in the esophageal baseline pressure, then why is there a uh, obstruction or why is there a uh, esophageal constriction of the sphincters? 
then this is not the answer. And absent of esophageal body peristalsis, yes, of course. So the answer is going to be, again, as you all told, the answer is going to be the C. Okay, C is the answer for this question. Okay, so there's a ease of increased esophageal baseline. So what happens is, there is actually increased esophageal baseline. It is not decreased esophageal baseline. It is increased esophageal baseline. Okay, well, so what happens is, manometric features of aclasia are incomplete lower esophageal spinter relaxation. There is a A peristalsis of your esophageal body, elevated lower esophageal pressure, and increased intraesophageal baseline pressure relative to your gastric baseline pressure. Eye resolution manometry is the investigation of choice. We are going to use that uh, to measure the intraluminal pressure activity of your gastrointestinal tract using a series of closely spaced pressure sensors. For manometry system to be classified as high resolution, okay, the pressure sensors need to be spaced one centimeter apart. So one centimeter apart, if you're going to place the space, uh, you're going to place the sensors, then you consider it as a, then you're going to consider it as the high resolution. So can you see this picture? So this is the conventional. So if you see, this is the conventional one which they are, which are used. This is the conventional one which are used and uh, this is actually based on the water perfusion uh, findings. And this is your natural uh, manometry, the high resolution manometry which are used. If you see, this is going to be denoting the time. Okay, so this is going to be denoting time. This uh, denotes the time. And uh, what does this do? So this is going to be your upper esophageal sphincter. Okay, this upper esophageal sphincter, what it does is, it is going to be continuously having pressure except this point where swallowing occurs. So once you take the food, so swallowing occurs, right? So in the position, less swallowing. That's the proximal esophagus lower pressure. At one particular point called as nadir point where there is no... Uh, pressure from your valve that is going to be your middle uh, one third that is going to be your middle one third in the distal esophagus so especially at one particular area you are going to have this uh, contraction so you are going to have this uh, contraction can you see uh, in the particular area you have contraction you have this crural diaphragm contraction which will be occurring earlier so, uh, in the six seconds, you earlier away. Distal esophagus, what happens is you are going to have increased pressure. So, aclasia or the main problem is that distal esophagus, you have increased pressure. Can you see here? At the distal esophagus, the pressure is raising. Okay. At distal esophagus, the pressure is raising. So, this we measure it here in the millimeter of mercury. So, can you see here the color change? So, this particular area, there is going to be increased pressure and that is what your lower esophageal sphincter. I hope so. You are now clear how to interpret this manometry. Okay. Very, very important. You have to interpret manometry. This is a AIMS question. AIMS like a question is this. So, I want you all to be very clear about it. Okay. Next, let me move into the LS myotomy. LS myotomy, I will show you a picture of LS myotomy also. Wait. Uh, so this is going to be your LS myotomy. Can you see here? So this is going to be how the LS myotomy is performed. And uh, this is going to be uh, how it will be going. It will be like uh, removing your lower esophageal sphincter. They will be like cutting it down. Okay. They will be like cutting it down and make sure that the passage is clear for the foot to go. And this is your uh, poem and this is your LS myotomy. LS myotomy, you go by straight. Uh, uh, you go in the open incision direction. So you will be putting an incision and you will be doing. But POEM is nothing but it is going to be, uh, I already told you, right, notes procedure. So what it does is it goes through your oral route as an endoscopic method and it is going to remove. So either way, it is going to be helpful for you. And to summarize, aclasia is the most common esophageal motility disorder. A normal endoscopy does not include the diagnosis of aclasia. Beware of pseudoaclasia. So pseudoaclasia is caused by your cancer. So your eye resolution manometry is a gold standard for diagnosis. Laparoscopic myotomy, pneumatic balloon dilatation, POM or effective treatment. Type 3 aclasia may be better treated with long myotomy by POM. Okay, this is what, uh, this is exactly summary given your, by your Bailey and Love. I'm just taking from Bailey and Love only. And next we are going to move towards this concept that is called as your diffuse esophageal spasm. So what happens in your diffuse esophageal spasm? This is nothing but, uh, it's a, 
most common motility disorder abbi nama sollama no this is less common motility disorder when compared to achalasia but uh, it is going to be second most common uh, type of motility disorder it is more common in the male female compared to that of male and you can see motor abnormality of esophageal body and repetitive contraction increases your amplitude when i going to go for the clinical features there is a chest pain dysphagia acid reflux uh, abnormality and medical management surgical management rendered to surgical management you go for poem okay i already discussed about manometry so increased duration uh, less than to more than 2.5 cm and there is going to be increased amplitude more than 120 mm of mercury increased amplitude no more than 120 mm of mercury and you need to understand a very important thing in the okay what is a dci i already told you what is dci it's a distal contractile integral so it is going to be corresponding to the index of contractile vigor so more than 450 mm of mercury it will be there and uh, lower esophageal sphincter will be relaxed okay well, so esophageal diverticulate next what we are going to talk is we are going to go forward and talk about the esophageal diverticulate okay well, so before uh, when you are going to move into the esophageal diverticulate what i want to talk is i want to discuss about this uh, skiadzis gearing so what is the skiadz gearing so it is a b ring okay it's a b ring so mucosa and submucosa is going to form a ring and can you see here? can you appreciate so you are going to have a uh, constriction so that there is going to be intermittent dysphagia so what you will do is you will go for a norm balloon dilatation method okay next what we are going to go is we are going to discuss about the diverticulum so uh, just listen carefully what you are going to discuss in diverticulum is there is going to be three type of diverticulum it can either occur in the upper esophageal part or middle esophageal part or it can occur at the lower esophageal part upper esophageal part lacrachna that is zenker's diverticulum middle esophageal part lacrachna that is your parabronchial diverticulum parabronchial diverticulum adhe vandu if it is going to occur in the lower okay adhe if it is going to be occurring in the lower okay adhe it's going to be occurring in the lower then you call it as the epinephric diverticulum ep ep epiphrenic sorry epiphrenic diverticulum phrenic means it is going to uh, refer to your diaphragm so epiphrenic diverticulum okay zenker's diverticulum it is again a false diverticulum it is going to be present in the upper one third and uh, there is a pulsation diverticulum increase in the pulse so to see this zenker's diverticulum i think i can show you the zenker's diverticulum image this is your zenker's diverticulum or you can call it it is going to be present at the kihilens okay kihilens degesens la irukku idu it starts in the midline post and it is going to be posteriorly and it is going to travel in the left side of posterior i already told you at the upper and in the lower it will be the esophagus will be traveling in the left side that is the reason there will be false pulsation so upper one third la what is there is you have the space between your cricopharyngeus and thyropharyngeus and the cricopharyngeus thyropharyngeus gap la unga mucosal submucosal uh, part vand it is going to get uh, herniated nu solalam illa vand it is going to get uh, diverticulated nu solalam so what happens is due to the increased pressure there is going to be a pulsation division and here what happens only mucosa is going to be there so there is not going to be however uh, what to tell there won't be any uh, good amount of uh, your esophagus coming out or it is not going to be like a extension it is going to be simply a mucosal submucosal extension that is the reason why we call it as a false diverticulum okay and uh, coming back to the mid esophageal okay when you're going to talk about the mid esophageal so this is the only true diverticulum this is a previously asked question so example of your traction diverticulum seen in tb and histoplasmosis lower again epinephric diverticulum again it is going to be very similar to that of your uh, zenker's diverticulum this zenker's diverticulum usually they ask as a short note for you all okay zenker's diverticulum is nothing but it is upper one third okay we have the skilian degesens where there is a space between your cricopharyngeus and thyropharyngeus anga pressure aadanalo ungalku pulse attack vella varudhu what is the clinical features you have number one regurgitation number two allostosis number three you have your dysphagia complication is going to be your uh, okay aspiration pneumonitis and uh, your investigation of choice is going to be your barium swallow so you have two type of barium swallow large barium swallow and small barium swallow so large idu irundhu nechukongala large ungalku therinjaduna that you are going to go for a diverticulotomy and a cricopharyngeal myotomy can be done to prevent the recurrence uh, second type is going to be your endoscopic uh, diverticulopexy that is called as dolamen so then you are going to do cricopharyngeal myotomy so this is going to be done with a linear stapler 
and small chinada and then you go for bitox to cure it and finally you're going to have your ietal hernia most common diaphragmatic hernia sliding type of hernia so there is not a life threatening and only symptomatic treatment is required clinical features you have this uh, very similar to the top jerk and one of the important question asked is going to be the investigation of choice for ietal hernia so investigation of choice for ietal hernia is your ct investigation of choice for your ietal hernia is going to be ct investigation of choice for your ietal hernia it is going to be ct okay and what is going to be a treatment of choice gerd management okay whatever you do for your gerd for example you go for a ppi then you go for a fundoplication ah correct ah gerd treatment of choice and fundoplication what are the different types of fundoplication can someone tell me the chat box you have your three types of fundoplication number one you have a nissen spend application number 2 tors spend application number 3 you have the stoppets fund application number 4 you have your blessy uh, mark uh, fund application and you have other type of fund application also apart from the one given by me when i'm taking class yesterday those are nothing but i'll just tell you once again uh, type to, before moving to it i'll just discuss about this and i'll just move there so type 2 is nothing but your para esophageal hernia is called as your type 2 and you have something called as type 3 type 3 is nothing but mixed so type 3 abdina na type 3 is nothing but when you are going to have a mixed type m i x e d mixed type so you have your rolling as well as sliding rolling as well as sliding and recent bailey actually includes a fourth type type 3 varaiku dhaan kuduthundanga re palaya bailey book varaiku ipo recent bailey updates la and sabiston update leyume type 4 they have given as a other contents of git herniating other contents of git herniating apart from your esophagus then there are certain minor topics which we will be dealing it before that i'll show you the picture then i will come back to this okay this is going to be your zenkers diverticulum zenkers diverticulum okay this is your zenkers diverticulum anyone has any doubt so this is your zenkers diverticulum and can you see here yes and uh, this is going to be your uh, what is this what is this at the g junction you are going to have yes this is your sliding hiatus hiatus hernia so this is a most common type of hiatal hernia is your sliding type of hernia you are going to be having a investigation of choice which is asked in your exam investigation of choice is going to be your ct with oral contrast okay you need to remember the ct with oral contrast is the investigation of choice and uh, what is this can someone explain tell me This is your esophageal leiomyoma, most common benign esophageal disease. Benign esophageal lesion. Okay, it's a benign esophageal lesion which you need to know. And apart from it, what you need to add on is I'll just uh, wait a minute. I'll just add on few points here and there wherever I have left it. and uh, we can just uh, continue with the infection because esophagus is going to get over i just wanted to add few more points which i have left it so when i'm going to talk about this fundoplication when i'm going to talk about this fundoplication remember there are uh, various types of fundoplication this one so you have this the first one which we actually discussed is a nissen's type of fundoplication 360 degree fundoplication then you have this uh, dors fundoplication where we just talked about no need of this 200 and all anterior 180 degree fundoplication you also have posterior 1 to 180 to 270 fundoplication that is your taupet idu moolu da nama padichirpom apart from it you, we also read about the belsis mark 4 that is 270 degree anterior transthoracic fundoplication 270 degree anterior fundoplication there is another one also that is your tal thal then your watson that is going to be 90 degree fundal plication okay that i thought of adding you and uh, see this management of barrett's esophagus i wanted to add some more points which i saw okay so you have your seattle protocol etc so seattle protocol nama indha maari nam or periya step ah nama paatho management la 
Uh, what I have done is I have just given you this is your CRTOS protocol four quadrant biopsy every two centimeter you have to take. So other in the simple solo pona CRTOS protocol la first you are going to see whether it's a Barrett's or whether it's a dysplasia or whether it's a cancer. Cancer na is affected to me pane no. Okay Barrett's na you go for metaplasia continue for two yearly protocol. If it is dysplasia you are going to see whether it's a low grade or high grade by radio frequency ablation or foregone photocoagulation. Okay, uh, then low grade dysplasia was six months protocol, high grade dysplasia was three months protocol. Okay, well, six months protocol, three months protocol. I just want to add this point also. And uh, yes, and then one more point I wanted to add is regarding the esophagectomy. So, esophagectomy, you have actually three types of esophagectomy. McEwen's approach, I already told you this, even though I am repeating, then you have this trans -sagatal, then you have this Iver Lewis. McEwen's approach, it is done uh, upper one third and middle one third tumor. Transiatal, lower one third and middle one third. Iver Lewis, middle one third, lower one third. So, all of them middle one third. Uh, how to know at where you have to do? So, in the question, on the, I don't know why you people haven't asked me. So, middle one third is nothing but upper one third, Kandipa McEwen's approach. Lower one third, Kandipa you are going to do Iver Lewis approach. Okay, well, lower one third, Kandipa Iver Lewis approach. Similarly, transiatal approach, rendu, uh, middle one third, lower one third, rendu thilime pannla. Anna, in the Iver Lewis li mekki van layu, nama on the mid one third solro ma thengla. Appa, in the middle one third and differentiate panni kutthi rukkanga namakku. So, mekki vans lena solro rukkanga na, when the middle one third above your aortic arch, then you go for mekki vans approach. Middle one third, which is going to be below your aortic arch, then you go for Iver Lewis approach. Okay, well, so McEwen's is the best approach because you're going to three incision is made and you're going to anastomose situs at the neck. Trans la complication or atelectasis, mortality due to anastomotic leak. I know that we prefer pandradilla. Next question that is asked commonly is what is the best conduit after esophagectomy? So esophagectomy panting, what is the best conduit? It is a stomach. So stomach is a male yield through the panu. It is a pretty different get all the best conduit after carcinoma esophagus resection to get all the stomach. Na. But what is the best conduit after benign disorder? Na, it is not stomach, it is colon. Best conduit of choice after short segment replacement is jejunum. Okay, gastric conduct is based on the right gastric and gastroepiploic artery. This asked as a question already. Left colon conduct is based on left colic artery. Okay, and uh, the posterior mediastinal route is preferred for the placement of conduct as it is the shortest route. Now, this is what I told you. Right gastric and right gastroepiploic artery. That is the one. And proximal stomach and lymph node are the typically resected along the segment of esophagus. Gastric conduct is then fashioned by tubularization of stomach. The right gastroepiploic artery is preserved and other arteries are ligated to make ample length and mobility for the conduit. It is of utmost importance that the right gastroepiploic artery is preferred as ischemia to stomach will result in anastomotic leak. So, other than prevent under the right gastroepiploic artery is preferred. And one more thing, what I wanted to add is not just this esophagectomy is the treatment of choice. So, you want to understand that in the T1B, T1B refers to 1B refers to submucosa. So, when the tumors extending to submucosa with a regional lymph node involvement N1, then you go for first chemotherapy, then followed by esophagectomy. EMR, endoscopic mucosal resection is done for small tumor confined in the mucosa itself, that T1A and no lymph node is involved. But T1A, no lymph node is involved. Now you go for endoscopic mucosal resection, whereas chemo radiation followed by esophagectomy is done in T1B N1. Esophagectomy and chemo radiation is going to be done when the tumor extends into submucosa. Submucosa could be no lymph node involvement. Na, esophagectomy plus or minus chemo radiation. But when it is going to extend into lymph node, chemo radiation followed by esophagectomy. And chemo radiation is done palliative measure in advanced esophageal carcinomas. Okay, wow. You have to understand that an esophageal stent placement is done in patient with advanced cancer or severe dysphagia that is not resolved by chemo radiation. That is called as a SEMS. So SEMS is a treatment of choice in malignant trans fistula. 
So it's a treatment of choice in malignant transesophageal fistula, which you need to understand. Okay, so is there any doubt? And I will show you the transesophageal fistula, which I didn't show you on that day. So this is your transesophageal fistula. I showed you this picture, isn't it? This is a straight X-ray, erect X-ray. This from your lateral view, you can see this uh, fistula, SEM. Okay, well, can I see this SEM? And this is going to be your SEM. Okay, once after completion of this, next I'm going to move towards the last but not the least uh, uh, topic that is going to be your what is this can someone tell me what is this this is nothing but your rolling hiatal hernia this is your rolling hiatal hernia okay remember this is your rolling hiatal hernia and uh, what is this can someone tell me what is this this is what we are going to discuss now yes so now we are going to discuss about the infections so, esophageal candidiasis, it's an oral thrush. It is seen in the immunocompromised individual. You have a shaggy deposits in esophagus, uh, which is going to be like a warm-like ulcer in your barium skin. So, warm-like ulcer is what I showed you now. So, this is your candidiasis. Okay, this is esophageal candidiasis. Esophageal candidiasis and can you see here? So this is going to be a warm like appearance. This is going to be a warm like appearance of esophageal candidiasis. And next we are going to discuss about the last and final CMV. It is a post transplant patient. So you can see this serpingenous ulcers can be seen. And talking about herpes, they are associated with the herpes uh, labialis and small ulcers with raised margin can be seen. The last one is going to be a feline esophagus. Feline means cat. So this can be seen in the upper one third or lower one third. Lower one third you treat it as GERD. But upper one third you call it as esophilic, esophilic esophagitis. So esophilia will be more and that leads to fibrosis of your esophagus. And it occurs in the rings, fissures and drip paper mucosa. Okay. And what is going to be a PKH? PKH is going to be 20 to 30 years. And biopsy will be uh, yeah, two different places. We are going to take more than 15 eosinophilic HPF will be uh, per eye power field. You can see the treatment of choice is going to be your steroid. So treatment of choice is going to be your steroid and uh, topical PPI, topical st PPI can be given. So give a topical steroid and your PPI proton pump inhibitor can be given. Okay. Well, so then you're going to have your Treatment, other treatment is going to be reduce the eosinophilia. So how you reduce the eosinophilia? Is there any infection or parasitic infiltration? You're going to just uh, see it. Okay, with this, we are actually completing the second part of your uh, entire journey. We have discussed about uh, starting from your uh, eso okay, from your uh, esophagus anatomy to we have discussed about feline esophagus. So what we will do at the next uh, tomorrow morning is tomorrow when we are going to start about with the next topic, what I will be doing is I'll just revise back from again uh, for first 10 minutes. We will revise not entire esophagus from but Barrett esophagus. So till Barrett esophagus, we have already revised. So after Barrett esophagus, we will once again revise it so that it will be helpful for you. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. So I'll see you in the next session.